Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, last week I came to the floor to offer an amendment to preserve basic workplace protections for LGBT Americans. My amendment would have kept taxpayer dollars from going to government contractors who discriminate against LGBT employees. That's it. It said you cannot take taxpayer dollars and fire people just for being gay. There are 28 million Americans working for employers who receive taxpayer dollars, and simple math will tell you millions would have been protected from arbitrary firing. So it made sense, it was fair, and it deserved a fair vote. When the vote was held, a bipartisan majority of this House, including 36 members of the majority party, supported my amendment. That tally clock right there showed 217 yes votes, four more than the 213 needed that day to pass. With all time expired, it was clear as can be that equality had won the vote. But when the world watched, Something else happened. Something shameful happened. Something about sticking up for basic workplace fairness for LGBT Americans rankled certain people around here, even though my bill would have simply applied the same standard to LGBT employees that we have long applied when people are fired because of their race or gender or religion or disability. It simply was too much. Even though we would have preserved time-honored religious exemptions, it was too much. Something about treating LGBT people fairly just wouldn't do. So people went to work. Though all members had voted, strangely, the expired clock stayed open four times longer than it should have. The gavel did not fall. And as we all watched, the tally began to change. 217, 216, 215. The votes in support were dropping. Members of this House were changing their votes. Why? From being in support of fairness, they were now changing them to be opposed to it. Down the vote went, 214, 213, and yet no one came to the well as is customary to announce their vote. It was all in secret, happening out of sight, so no one might see the ugly reality of what was happening. And what happened? Well, when it hit 212, one vote shy of the majority it needed to pass, one vote shy of the majority it had a few moments earlier, but the gavel came down, and the, and the result was declared a defeat. It was a shameful exercise, made more shameful in that it took place on a civil rights vote that enjoyed a majority of support, a bipartisan majority of support in this House. From Portland, Maine, to Des Moines, Iowa, to Southeast Oregon, to Bakersfield, California, newspaper editorial boards, radio hosts, and ordinary citizens joined a chorus that was heard first on this floor. Shame, they said. Shame on those who would betray the will of this House, who would betray this vote. And shame on anyone who would rig this vote, who would rig this vote and rig our democracy. Shame on those who snatched discrimination from the jaws of equality, especially those switching seven who, having at first voted for fairness, allowed themselves to be dragged backward into voting for discrimination. On Friday, at a meeting of my Veterans Advisory Board back home, I spoke to decorated military heroes and civilians who've dedicated their lives to the service of this country, to a person they were outraged by what happened on the floor of this House. One member of the group, Edie, who served as a first lieutenant and combat medic in Vietnam, said when she heard about the rigged vote, she thought of her daughter, who right now is serving her country in the military. And Edie's daughter is a lesbian. Edie said, when my daughter finishes her active military service, she will enter the civilian workforce, perhaps for a government contractor, as so many vets do. Will they be able to fire her even though she and I are both veterans? Mr. Speaker, does Edie's service in combat count for anything here? Does her daughter's service right now for this country count for anything here? Her daughter isn't alone. There are 71,000 active duty LGBT servicemen and women right now, and over a million LGBT veterans making it easier to fire LGBT Americans, even LGBT veterans, isn't honoring our values. It's sacrificing them to preserve a worn out and dying prejudice that weakens our nation rather than strengthening it. So today, I want to thank Speaker Ryan for allowing an open process so that I can offer my amendment again. It is, a, it is through this open process that we can give our colleagues another chance, a second chance, to do the right thing and to stand for equality. Let us this time ensure that no taxpayer dollars will be used to discriminate 
against hardworking Americans simply because of who they are, simply because of who they love. And we will also reaffirm legitimate religious exemptions that the President also included in his executive orders on this subject. Discrimination has no place in our law. It does not make our water cleaner. It does not power our homes. It doesn't defeat ISIS. It doesn't support our veterans. Every American deserves Gentleman's the right to work, expired. support a family, and achieve Gentleman's the American dream, expired. regardless of who the they are or who suspend. they love. And I urge my and colleagues to stand up for discrimination and adopt my amendment to the bill. Gentleman from, who seeks rep recognition? Mr. Speaker, I have an amendment to the amendment. Mr. Chairman? The clerk will report the amendment to the amendment. Mr. Chairman, could we ask that the amendment be read in full? The clerk will report the amendment. Clerk will report it. Amendment offered by Mr. Pitts of Pennsylvania to the amendment offered by Mr. Sean Patrick Maloney of New York and the section proposed to be added, insert before the period at the end the following, comma, except as required by the First Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment, and Article I of the Constitution. Pursuant to House Resolution 743, the gentleman from Pennsylvania and a member opposed each will control five minutes on the amendment to the amendment. Mr. Chairman. General Woman from And then I Ohio. would like to reserve a point of order. A point of order is reserved. And the chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to offer this perfecting amendment to my colleague's amendment. This amendment's very simple. It would merely state that as the federal government spends money with regard to contracting, the administration must not run afoul of the First Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment, or Article I of the Constitution. The President's executive order referred to in the Maloney Amendment defines a law that was never defined by Congress. It violates the equal protection rights of individuals that are merely seeking work from the government. With this amendment, this Congress can help ensure that while funds may be going out the door to implement this the policy... Gentleman, yield for a question? When I'm finished... With, he, with this amendment, you. this Congress can help ensure that while funds may be going out the door to implement this policy, he must respect Congress's authority to write the law, respect an individual's right to exercise his or her religion, and respect their rights to work. Does anyone in this chamber seriously oppose Article I of the Constitution? the First Amendment or the Fourteenth Amendment, I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting the Constitution and limiting the damaging effects of this executive order. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. What purpose does the gentleman from New York seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I believe I have five minutes in opposition to the amendment. In opposition of the amendment to the amendment. I do. Then the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, I thank the Speaker. Uh, may I have it, may I, uh, Mr. Speaker, may I have the amendment read back? Does it include the, does it include only the First Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment, and the Equal Protection Clause? Without objection, the amendment to the amendment will be reread. And the section proposed to be added, insert before the period at the end the following, comma, except as required by the First Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment, and Article I of the Constitution. The gentleman from New York is recognized. Well, I'd like to ask my, my colleague what is meant by Article I of the Constitution, if he could clarify that for us. No one, no one uh, who supports my amendment, certainly not I, uh, has any problem, sir, with the, uh, with the First Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment, uh, particularly the Equal Protection Clause, uh, or with Article I of the Constitution, I assure you. I also, however, would note, and I'm sure the gentleman would appreciate, that many times throughout American history, presidents under their authority under the Constitution have acted uh, in the area of workplace discrimination, particularly in the executive branch. For example, uh, would the gentleman oppose uh, President Truman's action to integrate uh, the armed services? Perhaps he would like that order uh, to, to be circumscribed in some way, unless if he thinks that violates Article I of the Constitution, Article 14 
of the, uh, the 14th Amendment or the First Amendment to the Constitution. In other words, the President has throughout American history, under his uh, constitutional authority, taken actions to widen the circle of opportunity and to end discrimination in the executive branch. Nothing in my amendment, nothing in my amendment is in any way uh, at odds with uh, the Constitution of the United States or the amendments thereto. But it should not be, it should not be allowed to go un unchallenged on the floor of this House to suggest that President Obama, in his executive action in 2014, uh, ran afoul of any of those things either. Indeed, I'm unaware of any legal challenge to the President's action in those executive orders of 2014. It's pretty clear to me that if there was something illegal or unconstitutional about them, there would have been a challenge. I don't think anybody seriously contests the President's authority to do what he did uh, in 2014, and many Americans welcome it as one of, a, one of the signature equal protection actions by a Commander-in-Chief or by a President of the United States. So far from being concerned about reconciling our activities with the Constitution, we believe they are perfectly consistent. And, 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 and therefore, I would, I would ask the gentleman if he would be willing to also include, since, since we're so fond of the Constitution, Article 2 of the Constitution, which, uh, which, which, which specifies the powers of the President, if the gentleman would answer that question. In other words, if we're so fond of, fond of the Constitution, what do you say we follow the whole thing, sir, including the Civil War amendments, including some of the things about equal protection, due process? You might have heard of something about that. We had a little dispute about that in mid-19th century. What do you say we abide by the whole Constitution, the part that tries to make it more progressive, more inclusive, of people like me, of people of color, of women, of people who were shut out when it was written? How about we include the whole Constitution? Can we do that? The gentleman will address his comments. Mr. Speaker. Speaker, how about we include the whole Constitution? Can we do that? General, will continue. Hearing no objection, I assume we're including the entire Constitution, including the powers of the President under Article 2. So with, with, with that, Mr., uh, Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserved. The gentleman from uh, Pennsylvania has yielded back his time. Sir, therefore, the gentleman from New York is recognized on the amendment to the amendment. How much time do I have remaining, sir? And you have two minutes remaining. Well, then let me just say again, the point of today's vote is to, is to redo a mistake that was made in this House. But of course, it wasn't really a mistake, was it? It was, a, it was an effort to, to change the outcome of a, of, a, of a bipartisan majority supporting an amendment to end discrimination in federal contracting. So today, what we're doing is getting a second bite at that apple giving members a chance to vote their conscience, to do the right thing, free from any pressure, free from any vote swapping or switching, free from a, a, a clock being held open long, long after it should have closed. The American people want to know if their government's on the level. So let's have this vote on the level. We know there is a bipartisan majority for equality in this House. And if allowed a fair vote, we know what the outcome will be. And I look forward to that vote, Mr. Speaker. And I would reserve the balance of my time. Any other speakers? The gentleman from New York has all of the time remaining no, on the amendment back, to Mr. the Speaker. amendment. And he yields back. Mr. Chairman. Ohio seek Thank recognition. You. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Does the gentlewoman continue to reserve her point of order on the amendment to the amendment? We are willing to. Um, do you want the chair to roll? Do you want the chair to roll now? Yeah. Okay. What do you want us to do? Do we want to withdraw? I'll point of order. Okay, but do we need to withdraw? Yeah. Okay, we can withdraw the point of order. Okay, we would request withdrawing the point of order, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. And does the gentlewoman seek uh, recognition in opposition? I do. The last word. All right, I move to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Yes, I just wanted to say that I associate myself with Congressman uh, Maloney's remarks. A workplace discrimination is a crime uh, that we as lawmakers have long sought to mitigate. And I have to say I admire him for his courage, uh, for his eloquence, and for being here this evening. And I would like to yield my uh, remaining time to him in order to complete his statement. Well, no, I, I, I think that you in time. How much time is remaining, Mr. Speaker? Yeah, four and a half minutes. Would you like the, would you like the time?
then just Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you for your indulgence. Um, Mr. Speaker, I want to make it perfectly clear that we stand here, um, we stand here, uh, servants of the Constitution, all of us, and all of the actions we take here are subject to uh, to that beautiful document as amended. And and so there is nothing about the the gentleman's amendment to the extent that it it simply restates uh, what is obvious which is that all of our actions are subject to the Constitution uh, that we would object to. And my only point is simply that we need to read it as a whole document. We don't need to read anything into it. We can read the text. We can understand the history of the text. We can understand the, the global and expansive nature of the language written into the Constitution after the searing experience of the Civil War around equal protection, around due process. We don't fear the Constitution. We welcome it. We embrace it. We claim it as our own when we come to this floor and ask that the circle of opportunity be widened for others who have been excluded before. We think that's in the best tradition of, of the American Constitution. We believe the Constitution provides a series of promises that, as King said, it's a promissory note and that a check was written, we're coming to cash it, that we'll all be treated equally, that we'll all be treated fairly, that we all count, regardless of who we love, regardless of the color of our skin, whether we walk in or roll in, we believe we all count, and we believe that the Constitution enshrines those values in the most beautiful way in all of human history. So far from being concerned in any way by the, uh, by the gentleman's amendment, we welcome it. But let it not detract from the fact that what happened in this House was an effort to enshrine and rationalize discrimination under federal law, and, it, and in despite the success we had in, in defeating that with a bipartisan majority, there were those here who wanted to perpetuate discrimination at the expense of equality. That is inconsistent with the Constitution, Mr. Speaker, and let that be the final word on this.